Um, this afternoon, I'd like to introduce Grant Ziegler and Daniel Nathan. They're going to talk to us about rough diamonds and, and most of all, how you value market and sell rough diamonds. And, and it'll be, I think, an eye opener for a lot of us to, and, and in particular, when you see the quality of alluvial diamonds, these special alluvial stones that we produce quite a lot of here in South Africa. Um, just by way of background, Grant Ziegler, he, he began his career in the diamond in industry as a small scale alluvial diamond miner. So he's been there and done it in the Northern Cape um, province. Um, he, he's actually a farm boy. He grew up on the banks of the Vaal River, um, north of Kimberley. And then th th aside from alluvial mining, he's also pursued small kimberlites and tailing retreatment operations. And he collectively now has 28 years in the diamond sector including working for 12 of those as a specialist in the marketing and sales of rough, rough, including the rare and exceptional stones. Daniel Nathan has over 30 years in the diamond industry, and he, he is a real expert in diamond valuation, valuation and marketing. His, his, his company, the one we're going to hear about today, is based in Johannesburg and specializes in the trading and polishing of rough diamonds and provides a range of services um, to the industry, both locally and internationally. So thanks, um, Grant and Daniel, and over to you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I guess um, a lot of, I would say the majority of mines in the, in the country, as well as the world, uh, might be very good at mining diamonds, but are not so good at marketing them. So we, there's a few sort of, what we call tender houses in South Africa, but they actually marketing companies where they um, sort of assist the mines to sell their production. In, 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 in doing that, uh, the diamonds are um, obviously in, in a very safe environment. There's a cleaning process they go through. We also know what the market wants and how they should be presented to the buyers. So we clean them and we parcel them and we give a value, which is more of an opinion, really, um, because at the end of the day, we invite, um, obviously, in South Africa, only licensed buyers to come and view the goods. And um, during a sort of week long um, auction, they um, value what their sort of speciality is, whether it be small diamonds or other very big diamonds or even at some of them by industrial so we present them in a way that um, is is conducive to how they want to buy the goods uh, most of them are manufacturers from all over the world and uh, we basically make sure that they are in a, a, a safe environment they've got they bring their own equipment uh, we put them up in offices and uh, over a week-long period they come and view and they bid on a closed auction. So they don't, they, they don't know what they're bidding on, or I'm sorry, who, who else is bidding on what. And after a week long sort of auction, they um, bid and highest price on each parcel wins, basically. So I don't know if I've skipped anything, but that's basically okay, what so we do. Yeah. So as you can see there, um, sorry. So it's a company based, sorry, company based in Joburg. And um, as Daniel has said, the, 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 the goods are brought in. Um, we're going to go through the slides and basically give you the rundown of how the industry works and then working with, with the buyers too. So we, we were quite fortunate to, to be able to have offices at the old American embassy in, uh, in Houghton, Johannesburg. Um, just basically, just from a safety point of view, the, the diamond centers in Johannesburg were originally in Main Street and have now sort of broken up um, and, and are in different areas. But we've managed to, to, to have our facility at the old American embassy, which is obviously you know, probably the most secure building in the country. Um, um, just based on sort of the valuation discussion, we, we obviously with a bit of experience from seeing so much rough, we have a very sort of um, a good idea of what diamonds are worth. 
we see a lot of alluvial rough diamonds in South Africa. So a, a lot of it's quite generic. So we understand what things are worth. But at the end of the day, the buyers that come and view the diamonds and bid and buy the diamonds is basically how you really gauge what the market price is. Um, we, we do use the four C's, um, which is um, also you know, related to the, the Rappaport diamond price, um, which is obviously the color cl cut, clarity, and carotage. Um, and, and based on looking at a diamond using particular equipment, um, we, we use that and go back to the Rappaport so that we can understand uh, based on all, all those four C's, what the price of a diamond is. Um, certain characteristics in a diamond will decide what discount off that Rappaport price will be. It may, there may be no discounts. It all depends. I mean, it depends on, on, on those factors. Um, the slide you're seeing now is the control room at the tender house, which is a central control room where we have offices around that control room where we pass the diamonds to the buyers. They, there's one way glass, so we, we are able to watch them because obviously it is a, a very high value commodity and we need to sort of make sure that, you know, we, we get the, the, the goods back that we gave them. Not that it happens. It's not often that that happens. It doesn't happen anymore, but still we need to be able to watch and make sure that we've, um, we monitor how the, how the buyers, how many parcels they get, the carriage they get, and they make sure obviously we get the same thing back. As Daniel said earlier, um, all the buyers that come to, to the tenders and to go back, there are a few tender houses in South Africa. Uh, there are three in Johannesburg. There's one in Kimberley. There might be another one. There's they, the negotiations for another one. And there's one in Swaziranica. And um, as you can see there, in the next couple of slides, you'll be seeing some of the equipment that these guys bring in. They bring all their own equipment. We simply from the previous slide to make sure that it's a clean and comfortable uh, environment they're sitting in very secure um, and as you can see there they all have to be registered so they'll either be registered with a company in south africa or they will be part of a company that's um that is internationally known so they will have uh, um their their companies are affiliated all, all around the world canada um, South Africa, even a few countries in Africa too. So there's, there's obviously a, a few different um, origins that diamonds come from. Um, um, as you, I'm sure you're all aware of the, 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 the big hole in Kimberley, which was a, a Kimberlite pipe. Um, obviously quite complicated to mine and, and there's only sort of so many companies in the world that can mine that kind of, um, do that kind of mining, should I say, which is Kimberlite, uh, Rio Tinto, De Beers, that, that, those sort of companies. And, and obviously you also get a alluvial type of diamond, which comes out of a old sort of riverbed. Um, um, and that you'll probably have heard during the course of, of the presentations over the past couple of days. Yeah, you could probably educate us a bit more about that, but... So, I mean, based on the, the, the two pictures you're seeing now, there's obviously there's the Kimberlite diamonds. Um, the picture that you see on the top there is what we've sort of recognized is, is in the Harry Oppenheimer building in Kimberley. You can see it's the view over the, the left-hand side there. So that's probably on the 11th floor. That's a Kimberlite production. You can see it's really good, bad, and ugly. You've got um, 100 carat stone to industrial. So that's... That's what we would call a run of mine production. There's everything in it. The bottom picture is more of a, um, I would say, diamonds that are have come through sort of from the Orange River into the ocean, into, in, into the sort of Alexander Bay, Port Nolith area. 99% um, gem quality. You won't see too much sort of industrial or anything of a sort of weaker purity and, and very, very healthy. You can see, I mean, there's... Just from that picture, there's hardly anything that's not top white in this picture, and obviously decent sizes as well. The Kimberlite sort of production will be 
somewhere can be anything from $10 a carat to sort of $200 a carat because of the industrial percentage in the, in the parcel. Whereas the, the marine production can be anything from sort of 500 to $2,000 a carat. So you can definitely see the difference in, in the, the, the sort of quality in those productions. Sorry, just to go back one or two slides, um, this stone on the, on the right-hand side here, so the question is down the bottom, what is the value that you would have or that we got for that stone on tender? It was a stone that was sold at the beginning of the year. Um, it originates, as you can see, from the Vol River, Northwest Province. Um, and I think Tanya, if she will correct me, but uh, you will be able to put it in the box at the end or inbox to see what you- uh, It's a competition. It's a competition, so yeah. You need so, to guess what the value of that diamond is. The winner will not get the diamond, <laughs> but you know, perhaps a case of wine or, or I don't know what the competition sort of prize is. And maybe a picture of the diamond, we had that we can do for you. But we, it's a competition just to see if you can guess total what dollar. we sold total dollar amount for this stone. It was a 78 carat. It was intense, fancy yellow, um, a perfect stone, clean stone. It was, for, it was a South African diamond. And from the Vol River, yeah, sort of, there's, there's the information on that. So that's the competition that um, we're running. Guys, okay. let me interject. Please put your, your guesses into the chat box before we get to the end of the presentation, and we will select the winner from that. Thanks, guys. Thank Carry on. Thank you. Um, so, so um, as Daniel also spoke a little earlier, and we're both going to talk about this, uh, these guys bring in all their own equipment. Um, to determine the best value that they are going to get out of that stone. There's a lot that goes into it, um, as you can see, the machines that I've used. So on your top left corner is, is a color machine, which was designed by an Israeli company. The color machine basically just gives you a, a, a second opinion. A lot of the diamond dealers will obviously look with using their eyes to see what color they think the rough diamond is. Um, Obviously, in a rough diamond, there's so many different factors that are sort of left to your opinion. You may think it's a particular color or the diamond will finish a particular purity. But when you're looking at the rough diamond at, at, at the marketing house, you need to make that decision. These, these particular pieces of equipment give you more of, of an educated guess. So the, the, the color machine on the left-hand side you put the diamond into the, in, you sort of lift that silver cap, you then put it into the machine and it'll give you an idea of what the, the color is based on the, whatever technology they use. Um, the, the, there's two sizes of machines. One um, takes up to 150 character. I think it's about $50,000. And the smaller one will take up to probably like a 40, 50 character. And that machine's $35,000. And the, the, the company can't make enough of them. They, the whole, basically the whole diamond industry worldwide uses these color machines. It's only really for rough diamonds. The machine on the right-hand side uh, measures fluorescence. So fluorescence is a natural um, characteristic in a, in a, in a diamond. Um, the less fluorescence, the more valuable the diamond's worth. The, the more fluorescence, it's, it's kind of a bit of a weakness in a diamond. It's, it's um, not really um, consequential to the sort of man on the street that doesn't really understand diamonds, but it's, it, it, is, it is a characteristic of a, of a diamond. Fluorescence is, is either very, very strong or nothing, that, nothing at all. And there's sort of obviously shades in between. Uh, the bottom machine is a, is a sarin machine, which basically takes a... Um, video of the model of the diamond and then with certain parameters you'll be able to see um, within that model what uh, recovery or what shape or what size diamond you could polish out of it it doesn't give you what imper imperfections are in the stone you'll have to with a bit of experience mark those on the outside of the diamond and sort of it's, it's quite a there's quite an art to it 
but these are very, um, every single company that comes to us has at least three or four or five of these machines um, in order to grade, grade the diamonds. There'll be the slides are coming up where you'll actually see the picture that the Saren produces on the, uh, the, the computer that is linked to it. So these guys have um, programs that they then work with to determine the best um, uh, uh, polished stone that they can get out of it. Also on the slide previous, it did mention certification. Um, the worldwide um, polished certificate would normally be um, you, the GIA would be used. The, the, the Gemological Institute of America is probably the most recognized polished diamond certificate. They also do pearls, gemstones. They are very, very well um, recognized worldwide. Um, any rough diamonds that come into South Africa from anywhere else in the world uh, would need a Kimberley process certificate. Um, it just kind of gives you the security that the diamonds, which, which mine they originate from and, and, and are not sort of obviously promoting uh, blood diamonds. So it is, it is a certificate um, that has to be produced when it comes into South Africa. Kimberley process certificate does give sort of the, the, the origin of the diamonds and, and that they are um, legal, basically. So on the next slide, um, it gives you, we're giving you a, a more of a color, a color description of uh, um, the, what you're seeing here are polished diamonds, but um, the, your, your top color um, being a D color is obviously colorless, which, which um, an ENF are graded in that uh, category as well. Um, the next grade would be as you can see, it's, it's, it's the alphabet, as you can see, starting at D. From G, H, R, J, you will start having a slight tint of yellow in it, but also obviously still near colorless. K, L, M, starting to get a little bit yellower. And then from an N to a Z, basically you start to get more and more yellow. These yellows are not necessarily um, the very valuable yellows in the in the way of intenses or fancy yellows. These are what we call in the industry cape yellow. So um, probably I don't know how many years ago there was a particular diamond that came from the cape area that had these shades of yellow and it's still recognized today. Anything from an O to a Z you would call a cape diamond. So if you can see on that slide that sort of gives you the, the, the description of, of white diamonds, um, obviously going from D to Z, and um, the bottom, the bottom um, chart shows you colored diamonds. So um, they're using blue color here, which we don't really see much of. We don't really see too many blue diamonds, but those are basically the, the shades of fan, light, uh, fancy uh, colors. So you'll go from fate to very light, to light, fancy light. Once you start getting from fancy to fancy intense, fancy vivid and fancy deep, those are very valuable and, and what you would actually call an investment diamond. The next slide is, is refers to clarity. So um, you, if you look at the chart, you'll see flawless. It's, it's quite self-explanatory. It's Flawless is obviously flawless. There are no, um, no imperfections whatsoever. Um, and these, a lot of these um, imperfections are graded using a microscope, as you can see. Um, the next grade from flawless is a VVS1 and VVS2, which is a very, very slightly included diamond. I mean, you're not gonna be able to see it with a 10 times magnification. It's gonna be very difficult. Um, you then going, the next group would be VS1, VS2, which is a very slightly included. You will start to be able to see those with a 10 times magnification. Uh, the next group's SR1, SR2, which is slightly included. There's a little bit more in the diamond. And then in the bottom group are quite badly included. They've got a lot more visible imperfections that you pr probably would be able to see um, with a naked eye. Um, like anything, these imperfections, 
you have good imperfections and bad imperfections. So you might have an imperfection that is a little glitz, a little crack that comes from outside in, um, but obviously pleasant. It's not something you'll be able to see very easily with any sort of magnification. And, and sometimes diamonds, polished diamonds are worth more if they have a very pleasant imperfection because they start to become more affordable. So that's basically the, the, the range of clarity. Right, cut. Um, cut basically is all the different shapes that you would polish in a, into a, in a diamond. Um, most popular is a round stone. Um, pear shapes at the moment, ovals, um, square emeralds uh, are quite also popular at the moment. Fancy shapes diamonds, fancy shaped diamonds are much cheaper, probably about 20, 30% cheaper than a round yeah. diamond. Because when you're polishing a round diamond, you lose more recovery out of a rough stone. Um, the bottom picture gives you a description of what some of the facets are called um, in a polished stone. So as you can see, the top of the stone would be the table. The facets just sort of bottom of the table are crown. The girdle is the area between the top and the bottom of the stone. The culet is the very bottom, the pointed part of the diamond. And the pavilion are the facets that are on the bottom of the, the bottom of the stone. So there's a description of the top and side and bottom of the diamond, polished diamond. Okay, so, go. so basically what we do is um, once the goods have come in, I just want to check. Yeah. Once the goods have been have been brought in from the different mines, we go through a whole sorting process. I mean, basically from a small producer who's giving me 200 carats to a slightly bigger producer who's giving me 5,000 carats, the process is still the same. You want to get the maximum out of these, out of the goods. And you want to be able to 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 give a presentation or or for the for the buyer to be able to select what he wants to buy, because at the end of the day, different buyers have different uh, uh, different ideas of what they want to buy. You'll get some buyers who only buy ten characters and plus. So those all those single stones will be parcelled accordingly. Um, you'll have some buyers who only buy melee. Melee for us is a sixty five pointer and down. So there's no point in taking. Um, 1,065 pointers and putting them in individual po uh, parcels. You're going to put them all together. Um, and so it's basically just keeping track of each individual um, uh, mine's production. Uh, we have quite a few. We have on our books at the moment, we probably have around about 30 producers. Um, as I said earlier, ranging from a guy who mines all on his own. He might even be a farmer. And on the sideline, he's doing a bit of a bit of bit of mining on his farm. He has the correct paperwork, and he brings me fifty carats or hundred carats, and then up to a, a, a proper alluvial miner who that's all he does. He has invested all his money. He might even have a few um, uh, partners from around the world, in fact, who have invested in me, invested in him, and he will then mine even all over South Africa. So the goods will come to us. Um, We'll clean them, we'll sort them, and it's basically a complete paper trail of each parcel. Um, the, They're normally packaged into sizes. Yeah. So you'll have any stone from a three carat up will be individually on its own, and anything lower than that will be then be parceled in sizes. Obviously, we can't mix everybody's diamonds together, but we know that a parcel of two carats uh, belong to a particular miner. The buyers do not know that. They have no idea who any of the goods belong to. It just has a parcel number, an amount of stones, and a carriage. They then obviously go online. They'll choose that parcel, whatever number it is, and they'll bid their highest price that they want to pay for that parcel. So you'll have, you might have 30, 40 bids on one particular parcel. And the buyers can be very, very close to each other. Some, some buyers have won a parcel or lost a parcel by a dollar because they don't know what everybody else is bidding. They're bidding on a blind, closed system. Um, the we run the tender from uh, basically the last two weeks of the month. This gives the, the uh, mines the opportunity to mine throughout the month, be able to, 
to get us their production goes onto onto the market and we run it from the tuesday for seven days basically and it runs all tenders generally run like i said earlier in south africa generally run towards the end of the month the ones being in kimberley the ones here in johannesburg because these guys fly in and they'll come to all the tender houses the, the diamond tender house the marketing house has we have no ownership over the diamonds we're purely a brokerage business we um, make sure that um, the diamonds are um, are presented correctly, cleaned correctly. We make sure we invite the correct people with the correct credentials and with the correct financial ability to, to purchase millions and millions of dollars in diamonds. We have no, um, no real involvement. Once the diamonds go on the sale, um, we obviously have no um, involvement in what the price it sells for. Um, we do make a reserve price or a valuation. Um, this sort of give, gives us an idea of, of, of what the value of the, the whole sale is worth, but it's, it's really just an opinion. It's, it's of no consequence to the result of the sale. The buyers do not know what that reserve price is. Uh, that information is not given to them. Um, you don't want to influence anybody to pay anything or do anything. So um, it's, it's, it's really their decision what the diamonds are worth. Um, and they, they are the market price because they are the ones that are buying the diamonds. So like I discussed before, the Rappaport price, we use this, or should I say the buyers use this to decide on what price to offer on a diamond. Once they've decided the shape of the diamond, the color of the diamond, the cut, the clarity, they'll then go back to this Rappaport price and decide based on this price what the diamond is worth either to them or their customer or, or whatever factors there are that go into valuing the diamond. This price list, as you see now, um, you'd have to add two zeros onto the prices that you see. Um, the Rappaport price and the price of a diamond is exponential. So you'll have certain sizes, will have certain prices. The minute you go to the next category, it'll go, it'll, it'll increase in price. So a 99 pointer and a, and a one character are completely different prices. It's almost a 50, 60% difference because once you've gone to the next category, the price then changes. Obviously a diamond with a much higher color and a much higher purity has a much higher value and a stone that is a much lower color and a much lower purity would be less lesser value. So like at the moment in the world, people that are sort of getting married and, and can only afford a certain thing would more look for a stone that's sort of middle of the range color, middle of the range purity, something affordable. Um, I know De Beers had a um, um, this there for, for, a, for the longest time their, their uh, pitch for their business was advertising, advertising that you, you, you should save up three months salary for a, for a diamond, which is uh, not so easy at the moment. But um, I guess you just need to try um, buy a diamond that you can obviously afford and something that has um, the correct value. I mean, uh, obviously retail is a different discussion, but um, this is the, what you're seeing now on your screen is, is how the diamond buyers and how we value a rough diamond using all those parameters of the, of the four C's with this price list, how we grade a diamond or value a diamond, should I say. So we use a online bidding system, which is obviously the service housed um, in, in, a, in a particular part of the world. And the buyers obviously log into our website. They have username and passwords. They'll go through, once the tender goes live, they'll go onto the list and they will bid on whatever they want to bid on. Some people, like Ron said, only buy small diamonds. Some people only buy big diamonds. Some people only buy yellow diamonds. Some people, um, obviously, most of them have um, um, are manufacturers. So 99% of what they're buying will be manufactured into a polished diamond at some point, um, whether it's 
bought here, uh, shipped overseas, sold in the rough to another company. It's all just whatever we're selling is, is, is being traded by all of them, whichever, whatever they're doing with it. Um, that's obviously not our business, but we have a online system where the guys can bid anywhere from the world. You might have a guy that's come to look at the goods on Monday. He's already flown back to Belgium and will bid on Sunday afternoon. So he may go back to his office and decide what to price. Um, most of all, having really the, the argument with himself about what to bid. And, and on, on a week later at a particular time, five o'clock South African time, all the bids need to be into the system and the system closes at that time. It's not really something we're in control of. That's just the way the system works. And once it's closed, it's closed. The highest price on each parcel will be the winner of that parcel. We still need to obviously ask the sale, the, the, the seller, the mining company, if they're prepared to accept that price. They may accept it, they may not accept it. If they don't accept it, obviously that stone will be withdrawn from the sale. So this is a result sheet, as Daniel's just spoken about now. This uh, result sheet will be sent to the, the mining company, uh, as you can see the name above there, and gives that mining company all the information he needs to decide whether he wants to sell or not. And as you can see pretty um, on the left-hand side, obviously the parcels, as we've broken it up, gives the uh, description. And as we said earlier, and as Daniel also said earlier, this is inf this information is only between the tender house and the mining company. This this information is 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 um, uh, we we discuss the information between us uh, on how they want to sell, what they what they want to sell. What he also spoke, as you can see the 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 way it's broken up into the different. Um, uh, parcels or single so, stones, eight to eight to ten grainers, um, ten grainers, and so it goes all the way down. And as I said earlier, melee. Um, the quantity is the amount of stones. Obviously, single being one stone, eight to ten grainers, three stones, and so it goes to the bottom. The total weight of the parcel that they brought to us. So this this was quite a small parcel, and then the reserve prices. As Daniel said earlier too. This is our opinion. This is not what. Uh, it's not an offer. It's not an offer. It's, not an offer. It's, it's our opinion of what we think these diamonds are worth. And it also helps us with our information. So if we think that a stone in a three carat 99 is worth a thousand dollars a carat, which we graded it as, that was our opinion. The fact that it sold for, or it was, or it was offered $1,200 a carat, it just means that someone has seen something different to us, or they have a particular order for that stone. Out of a 399, you should get a one and a half carat plus in a polished stone. And obviously this price that he's offered all relates back to the color, the clarity, the size, and the shape that he was looking to buy. So you can see that there's the, that's the highest price. You'll then see what came second on that parcel and third. And I mean, we could obviously give fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, but it's not really irrelevant. But this just gives the, the, the producer a good idea of what the diamond got offered and what the second and third was. Is there a huge difference between first and second? And, you know, how did everybody value it? Were all, that, were all of them pretty similar? And you can, if you have a look at this, it'll give you a good idea of how people bid and how close they are to each other. The winner might be, there might be a difference between first and second because he's, well, I don't know, seen something the other guy hasn't seen. But you'll also see a column which shows us the price per carat. And at the bottom, we will give the, the man their total highest bid, as well as what their average per carat was. This parcel is, uh, is an alluvial production uh, from sort of the Vormeranstadt, Schwarzerenica area. And, and this is how we don't give the buyers, we don't give the buyers names, the, the who won the parcel, because obviously that's also you know, confidential to them. And this gives you, this shows you when we give a result to a mining company, this is the information they've got. They can decide if whether they want to withdraw a particular stone. If they think that um, a stone was worth more and they would rather keep it, as you can see, like on the parcel 160, we valued it at 2,100. They got offered 2,300, so that's more. Sorry, let's go to the single here, the four character. We valued it at seven, they got offered six. They might say, 
well, you know, we thought it was worth seven. We're going to withdraw it, which is it's up to them. I mean, it's 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 at this point in time with the with the price of rough diamonds and the amount of people that we've got coming to see and their expertise. These people are experts. It's it, it's not recommended that you withdraw anything because obviously the price next month could be different with, with all that's happening in the world. The, the advice that we would also give to this producer is that look at the bigger picture. Your total reserve was $33,000. That was our opinion. You got 39. If you're going to withdraw one stone, does it re has it changed anything? I mean, yes, you're going to withdraw it. You're going to get, still going to get your reserve. But in the bigger uh, picture is that you've sold this production. It's, it's way more than your reserve. And the, the deal is done. So it's for them to decide. Absolutely. Cutting and polishing. We do have a cutting and polishing facility at the at the tender house, um, which does offer the buyers um, an opportunity that if there is something that they want to manufacture locally, um, because a lot of the diamonds get exported to factories around the world. Um, so just on the basis of trying to promote South African um, the South African industry and polishing diamonds in South Africa. All rough diamonds do hold a 5% export levy. So it does kind of convince, try and convince people to polish goods locally, but we can only sort of polish a certain size. We can't polish the very, very small diamonds. So we have a, a, a factory at the facility that um, does give the buyers an opportunity to, to polish something they've bought at the tender in, in the facility at Knox. And here you can see sort of what goes into to manufacturing. Um, so your top picture, just to show you what we're showing you here is, is, a, is a technology also that's available where you can um, almost get a diamond x-rayed by a company. It's called, it's called the Galaxy. So what they do is they um, make a sort of x-ray of the diamond and then the imperfections are plotted in that rough diamond, they charge a particular price per carat. Um, the information is then sent to you in a file, and then you're you're able to sort of plan the best recovery diamond out of that rough diamond. Just remember sorry that this can only happen. This sorry to only... interrupt, guys. Before you move on to the next slide, just stop. Let me know, and we can check all the the bids in the um, the chat box. Okay, cool. So what you're seeing here is, is this technology that, that people are using to, to, to see what comes out, the best maximum can come out of a diamond. This can only be done after you've bought the diamond. It's, 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 not, it's not available before we put the goods on the sale. This is, so there is still obviously that uh, manner of opinion when you come and look at the diamonds at the tender. But this is a, this is a technology that we use after a diamond has been bought especially just to maximize what's going to come out of the diamond. Um, if, if an imperfection is in a stone, you can how to eliminate it so that you can get a clean stone. But this, this particular technology is, is only really when you've decided that you're going to polish a diamond. So if we go to the, the chat box, um, I'll just read out the bids for you. and You can see the extreme variation we have here too. Um, start off with 2,000, 2.5 million US, 140,000 US, 2.550, or 2.5 2, 2 million, oh, 195,000, 14.5 million. Are these all dollars? Yes. Total, total dollars. 4.5 4. million, 8.26 million, 900,000, 12 million, 1.2 million, 2 million, 100,000, 17 million, 900,000, 7.5 million, 90,000, 25,000, 1.5 million, 
and 7.2 million. Those are the guesses so far. Okay. Okay. There were there were two that were yeah, pretty, pretty close. close. Yeah. Okay. All, all yours. Do we go to the next they're one? They're going to have to split the book, the case of one. <laughs> Okay, so there's your answer. Um, the stone sold for, on, on the auction, it sold for $1.1 $1 million. Um, it was approximately um, $14,000 a carat in the rough. Um, as far as I know, the stone polished out a 42 carat, 41 or 42 carat radiant cut diamond in an intense fancy yellow. Um, I can't, I don't know where it is now, but I, I did sort of get some information about what the result was. Um, and at the same time, the other picture that you see on your right, um, you could have a diamond that's uh, much smaller, but in, it has, has a intense pink color in it that can be worth the same value. So, you know, it's, it's very difficult to compare apples with apples in this instance. Um, some diamonds have... Um, very valuable characteristics, even though they're very small. So, yeah, I mean, it's 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 really quite a broad spectrum of of how valuable a diamond is. It might not be it might be very very big, but it can be worth nothing. So, it, it, it's quite difficult to compare two particular diamonds. And that's mm -hmm. it. That's that's diamond marketing. The gist of it. Thanks, guys. It was most interesting. Well done, Grant and, and Daniel. It looks like we, um, we we might have to stretch the budget and uh, award two boxes of wine or, or, um, or box yeah, of wine and a box of beer. Obviously, one closer than the other, but but anyway, it's it's so just, one, yeah, one point two, one point two, and one point five. I think yeah, and nine hundred. Oh, was there nine hundred as well? Nine hundred too. Yeah. No, there were two nine hundreds. I think. Oh, okay. No. That I've got on my list. Yeah. Okay, do you want to wasn't unshare? The, uh, wasn't the 1.2 closer than the 900? Yes. Yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah. Okay, sorry. Okay, well, we'll give a second prize then as well. Okay, do you want to check the figures in the chat box, Tanya? Yeah, I have done so. And the, the closest is um, Limpho Corbella at 1.2. Okay, let's um, open it up to discussion. Do you guys want to um, stop sharing? Okay, questions, comments? Yeah, Grant, um, it's Roman Grutter here. Just a quick question. If somebody wants provenance information, if a buyer wants provenance information, particularly for larger stones, is there a mechanism to disclose that? Um, yeah, yes, we can. We can. It all, obviously, it all depends on... on the yeah we can we can. yeah I mean if the, if if a if a buyer is if a buyer needs needs to know where it's from or 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 the GIA actually have a service where they um, can put on one of the certificates that the diamond is SA origin yeah. we can let the GIA know that we know where the diamonds from uh, which area and we on our invoice. Um, we will put there the origin of it. Obviously, can't say exactly who it came from. Oh, well, I can't put his name, but I can say the diamond is Northern Cape, or it's from Kimberley, or so. Yes, I, I, I am actually able to do that. Because what you must also remember, as he said earlier, if if it's if it's coming from uh, let's call it Africa, there will be a KP uh, certificate. In South Africa, um, I'm one of the the uh, guys who physically goes to those mines um and so i know the origin yes so it will be the area i will be comfortable with will i'll be able to say correct that's where it could come it's either northern cape or northwest or wherever and then pin it down to a, 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 a closer area uh, just to add to that for herman i mean certainly in our in our early rockwell days we did that as well i mean some some buyers particularly on the bigger stones um you know really we're quite emphatic about that, as you know, knowing where they come from. And I think there've been one or two ventures, and you can correct me, Daniel, on the West Coast, they've never really taken off, you know, where you could sort of go on a on a trip up the coast and get on a boat and, you know, almost go and mine your own own diamonds, which you could then, you know, take and get cut and polished. 
Yeah, there is, there is. I know there is someone that does that, um, that gives you that kind of experience. Um, I think one of the, the Stellenbosch groups have, have tried yes, it. Yes, correct. Really, correct. You know, they really they do, they do that. I don't know if they do it anymore. I'm not sure how often yeah, they do no, it. But there's, there's really a, got, apparently. They haven't got critical mass. So. I did see yeah. there is one question there. Is there a standard pricing? Uh, it, it then disappeared. Um, <coughs> There is, there's a standard pricing if you're going to go with a wrap report, correct. You can work it out. You can, you've got all your equipment. Uh, you've worked out that you've got a one character in a, or in the rough and you're going to get a one carat whatever um, polished out of it. But it also goes on feel. A lot of these guys have been in the industry for 30, 40, 50, 60 years. So they, they go and feel. They know exactly what they want out of that stone. Um, and like earlier we were saying about colors, you get guys who, who specifically buy yellow stones because he has sold so many in his life. He knows exactly that that's an intense, that's a vivid. He knows what he got for it two, three years ago. He'll work on pricing. So it all goes around feeling. There's no handbook. There's no, um, there's no, there's no, there's there's no, no fixed structure there's no of also, selling an arm. There's no public um, um, Bloomberg or any of these market uh, stock market indexes that discuss what a diamond's worth. It's very it's very easy to see what gold is at or silver yeah. or platinum or coffee or or oil. But a rough diamond, it, it, there's no um, sort of index to explain what a rough diamond's worth. You're not going to see on CNBC the price of a rough diamond. It doesn't. You'll, you'll never see that kind of information. The the, the diamond business uses the Rappaport list, which it's only, a starting point. It only really gives you the price of a diamond when it's complete. It doesn't discuss what it costs to polish it or certify it or what goes into polishing a diamond. That price that you're seeing on Rappaport is the finished article. It's a shape, it's a color, it's a clarity, it's a size. Whatever happens when, the, when someone is dealing or selling these diamonds, that, that's the price that it's trading for there's obviously some sort of discount that it's traded at uh, and and grant and daniel maybe maybe just also comment i mean you know when, when you're looking at diamonds if you're looking at um at the kimberlite goods and particularly the smalls and and remember you know most of the world's production averages 0 0.3 of a carat um so so if we're looking at these rather rare alluvial stones, um, you know, it, it's, it's a whole different market. Um, it, it, it's very, so, so those little stones you could consider as a commodity, there, there is more or less a price, um, you know, and, and, and the buyers and the beers and the Russians will all, you know, what that price is within a couple of percent on a daily, weekly, monthly, annual basis. Correct. These alluvial goods that are being produced, particularly from our you know, Orange River, Northwest Province, West Coast, are really special goods. And, and a lot of it goes back to, to exactly that. It's sort of, you know, it's a feel and a lot, of the, a lot of the buyers will actually be buying to feed into a niche market. Or, or in the case of the bigger stones or the colored stones, they will also have, um, you know, specific buyers lined up. Yeah, we, we had a customer, uh, one of the sales that had 60,000 polishers. So for him, it's more expensive for him not to have the product. So you, you, the price that he's prepared to pay might be more than someone else because he's got so many people that he needs to give product to to polish for him. If he doesn't have the product, he's, it's just going to be more expensive for him to, to maintain all those workers. But that's obviously very small diamonds. Yeah. And I mean, you know, these exceptional that the stones, for example, that Debbie Bowen and John talked about from Carr, um, the stones, the colored stones that come out of the Orange River. I mean, how often do you guys see, you know, really top quality stones, um, you know, coming across your desk, Daniel, they're extremely rare. We do. We do see quite a lot of rare diamonds. We see. Yeah, but you, you, you're you in the business. Yeah, yeah we, we, we get. Uh, on a monthly basis, anything from 4,000 to 15,000 carats a month, just depending on what's been produced. Um, a lot of factors is the rain. Um, load shedding is obviously going to cause a bit of a problem. 
Um, there's a lot of issues when it comes to mining. So some months will be more than others, but we certainly see a lot of very high value diamonds, uh, you know, very yellow, couple of pinks. We haven't seen too many blues. I must be honest, that's something that's really, really rare. Um, one of the questions I just saw now was something to do with a pink or purple or so um, we also we, we, we see very, very seldom see those kind of colors. It's, it's, it's almost Im impossible to decide on an actual value of them because we don't see them very often. So if you have a purple diamond on your tender, it's literally whatever price someone's prepared to pay for it. There's no yeah, willing, diamond. Willing buyer, like willing that. seller. Willing yeah, buyer. I mean, it's yeah. it's like, it's like a Picasso. You know, you don't see them very often and, and people are prepared to pay hundreds of millions of dollars for them because of the rarity of them. We don't, we don't see a lot of um, sort of pinks and blues and that sort of thing, but we do see a lot of yellows and very, very good yellows. Yeah. Okay, we did quite a few questions. The first one, obviously, and it's becoming a big thing, and I think, um, you know, Herman might have a comment, is obviously blockchain, um, particularly now with, um, I guess, the Ukrainian setup and people wanting to know where their diamonds are coming from. Um, there, there's a big, um, a big drive on to be able to trace diamonds with, with, with blockchain methods. Um, you know, De Beers have done some quite smart work. Um, I think there's still quite a long way to go. But has anyone else got comments on that? Anyone want to contribute? Um, sure. Blockchain for me, the, the the origin of the diamond. Yes, there are certain. There's certain most of what we receive we could we could probably tell you i mean we know where the diamonds come come from we know who our suppliers are we and very we, know we, we know them all i mean we we're very careful about who we sell for um i think the blockchain the blockchain facility would be good for the paying if you know if, if all of us had a, a a sort of wallet where we could send them money in one second decentralized that might be a different discussion, but we certainly know the origin of where our diamonds come from. We know we know exactly. No, yeah, but That's but if you have how many sales have you got each year? Ten or twelve? Fifteen thousand? Eleven. You, Eleven. Yeah, so maybe you sell two hundred thousand carats of top quality goods a year. I mean, you should be able to track track all that. We can, got yeah, it. In we know where they come from. Yeah, we do. We do. But you know, that can... the supply the, the the mine has to give us a broker's note or a well, we receipt give them the broker, yeah. to say that we're going to do the marketing for them. So we do, we know where everything comes from. And in fact, there was, we had a, we had a very nice stone in the beginning of the beginning of the year too. It was an exceptional yellow. And obviously when the buyers come through, they view the stone and they want to know that this is, this is the proper thing. So my answer, they, their question to me would be, is this a South African stone? Where does it come from? My reply is definitely South African. I know exactly where it comes from. The owner, we work very closely together. So trust me, I know where it comes. I think from. I think the discussion is. I think the question is, if you walked into Tiffany's in uh, Bond Street in London and you went to go buy a uh, hundred thousand pound diamond, they couldn't tell you where it's from. Mm. That's that's sort of the gist of the question. None of these companies can tell you where that polished diamond comes from. We no, we can tell you where the rough diamond comes from, but. None of these sort of high-end jewelry stores or, or, or any sort of diamond company selling polished diamonds can tell you where the diamond comes from. Definitely no. not. No, that's a work in progress, but it's an interesting Correct. one. Hans, you've got a question. Yes, thank you, John. Uh, regarding the provenance, there is already a company by the name Ocean Diamonds, and they specifically work on a marketing drive where the buyer will know exactly where the stone was was specifically in this case uh, marine diamonds was was mined from the ocean floor they would even go as far as to identify the diver who actually uh, was working with a suction hose at that time and uh, they you know might also include a picture of him or his wife and make it something of a personal journey for the the end buyer and thereby it's one individual stone that they trace back to the actual operator at sea. And obviously the added benefit is that it's very low environmental 
uh, disturbance because of unconsolidated sediments that just been moved around to extract the diamond comparing to other on-land operations. Thank you. Yeah, good, good point. Thanks, Hans. Um, right, the, 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 there was a question about um, purple and blue diamonds. I mean, I think in the you know the lead up presentations out of purple diamonds compared to pink diamonds. Well, purple are just extremely rare, and hence you know the price exponentiates. Um, must be, must you be certified to be in a position to price a diamond or is it experience based? Um, you, you know, pro probably the biggest um, factor, I think Daniel and, and Grant is experience, but you know, it helps to have the certificates and be able to study a diamond as well. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's not too many sort of um, schools or courses or things uh, to educate people on how to, value or buy diamonds we we've we've been through the the school of life we've uh, bought diamonds we've made we've lost we've we've learned the hard way so there's no real certification experience is basically your certification um i did do a course right when i started in the diamond business but i don't think it's available i don't think you can do it anymore um there were like a whole mix of people that were there that just really wanted to learn what diamonds were about, but it wasn't really sort of, uh, you weren't certified in any way um, for, 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 any, for any reason. Yeah, and just to add to that, I mean, yes, there are um, various courses that GIA have and courses. Correct. GIA and, is a very good course to do. That's, that's, yeah, that's, that's, for uh, that's something worthwhile doing if you want to learn about diamonds. And, and even if, you, if you're looking for a, um, um, a career in diamonds. The GIA course is something that's worth probably having as a as a as a as a certification, definitely.